In a typical calculus class, if the fundamental theorem of calculus is given any kind of an explanation as to why it's true, it's almost always this version of the theorem that is explained, the version that involves a derivative of an integral. But the version that we tend to use the most, the version that essentially says you can find a certain area by doing an antiderivative, that version is usually only explained indirectly as a sort of consequence of this version. But I would like to give a simple direct explanation as to why this version is true. Now, to be a little more precise here about the theorem, we're assuming that f is a continuous function and that capital F is an antiderivative. So in other words, capital F prime is equal to lowercase f. Now, the theorem says that we can evaluate the definite integral from a to b of f of x dx by doing capital F of b minus capital F of a. Now, remember, the definite integral, what this means is the area underneath the graph of f between a and b. Now, that's assuming that f is a positive function. If f is not positive, of course, we mean the net signed area between the graph of f and the interval a to b. But why is this true? Why can we find an area by doing an antiderivative? All right, now I'm gonna draw a function f, and just to keep things simple, we're gonna assume we have a positive function here. So this means it's graph lies above the x-axis. And we will go from a to b. And let's draw the region below the curve between a and b. And the area of this region is what we mean by this integral here. Now we're gonna begin by drawing an antiderivative of f. So what will this look like? Well, since f is a positive function, the antiderivative should be an increasing function. So let's draw an increasing function. And this is what we're calling capital F. Now, why is it increasing? Well, remember, if the derivative of this function is this function, what that means is if we pick a point on the curve and draw in a tangent line, so let's say like right here, if we go down to this curve here, the slope of that tangent line is the height of the function here. So if this slope is say 1.7, then the height here is 1.7. So whatever the slope is up here of the tangent line, that's how high the curve is. So since our function is always a positive function, that means the slope up here is always positive. So capital F is an increasing function. All right, now this point, this left end point here is a comma f of a. So let's write in f of a, capital F of a. And likewise up here, this would be f of b. Now let's draw a dotted line right here. And this vertical distance here, this amount right here, that is f of b minus f of a, capital F of b minus capital F of a. Right? Because it's this f of b minus f of a, that's this length, which is this vertical distance. Now notice this is just the right-hand side of the fundamental theorem of calculus here, f of b minus f of a. So what the fundamental theorem of calculus says geometrically is that this area here is equal to this length. Okay, this area is the left-hand side here. This length is the right-hand side. So the area under the curve is the amount that the antiderivative function rises between the two endpoints. That's what the fundamental theorem of calculus is saying. Now, I also wanna point out that we're looking at one particular antiderivative there are other antiderivatives, but they're all just vertical translations or shifts of this one particular antiderivative. So in other words, if we just shifted f up a little bit, so it like, looks like this, or shift it up higher, or shift it down, those would also be antiderivatives. But notice that the amount that any one of those antiderivatives would rise would all be the same. Okay, it would be this amount here, this length. So the question now is why? Why is this area equal to this length? Well, let's take our interval from a to b and divide it into some subintervals. So we've made a little partition here of the interval from a to b. And let's draw some vertical lines here. Now it's pretty clear that the total area here is going to equal the sum of the areas of these six individual little regions. And if we go up here and use the same partition, so let's partition this with the same little partition that we have. And let's draw in some lines. So we'll have a dotted line from here to here. Let me make this a solid vertical line, then a dotted line across, then a solid line, dotted, solid, and so on.
Now, isn't it also pretty clear that this total amount, this f of b minus f of a, is equal to this length plus this length plus this length and so on. So this amount is equal to the sum of the lengths of these individual vertical lengths. Now, what we want to show is that this total area is equal to this length. But if we can show that on any one particular little subinterval here, the area of this region is equal to the amount that the antiderivative rises there, this vertical amount, and that's true for every single one of these regions, then certainly the total area will equal the total length that the antiderivative rises, this total amount. So really, all we need to do is to show that the area of a region like this is equal to this length right here, the, the amount that the antiderivative rises on that little subinterval there. So how can we show that this area is equal to this length? Well, what we're really going to show is that this area is a product of two things. And this length is also a product of two things. And in fact, they're going to be the same two things. Now, one little adjustment that I'd like to make is notice that each of these regions down here has a curved top. But actually, doesn't the definition of definite integral involve a limit of Riemann sums? And when you do Riemann sums, you're doing sums of areas of rectangles. So what we could do is instead of having a curved top, we could have a flat top here. So we have a rectangle. Now you might wonder, so say we're in this little interval here, how high should you make the rectangle? Should you use the left end point to draw the, the height of the rectangle or the right end point or the midpoint, any point in the middle? Well, it turns out that it actually doesn't matter which point you pick because when you do the limit as the number of these rectangles goes to infinity so that so the partition gets finer and finer and finer you have less and less choice of where to pick that point and the definition of what it means for a function to be integrable is that it actually doesn't matter which point you pick the limit of that sum that Riemann sum should end up equaling the same value okay the value of the definite integral which represents the area under the curve okay so we can pick a point any point really in here and use that point. So we'll call it x star and use that point to draw our, the, the height of our rectangle. So the height of our rectangle is going to be f of x star. Now notice, what is the area of this rectangle? Well, notice, isn't it length times width, right? That's the area of a rectangle. Now the width here, we're going to call it delta x. And the height is just going to be this f of x star. So the area of this is just going to be delta x times f of x sub star. Now, what about here? What is this length, this vertical distance? Well, what we can do is look at the two endpoints of our interval here. We could actually draw a secant line between those two points. And we're going to look at what is the slope of that secant line. And isn't it true that the slope of a line is equal to rise over run? But doesn't this also imply that the rise is equal to the run times the slope? So just rearrange this equation, multiply both sides by the run. The rise equals the run times the slope. But notice, what is the run? Well, the run is just our delta x here. And what is the slope? Okay, what is the slope of that secant line? Well, notice we don't know exactly. But as long as our function is not too weird, our capital F is not too weird, Shouldn't it be true that any point in this little, on, on the curve here, should have a slope that's approximately equal to the slope of that secant line? In fact, isn't the slope of the secant line kind of an approximation of the slope of the tangent line? In fact, the mean value theorem says that there's got to be at least one point in here where the slope is exactly the same as the slope of the secant line. So there's got to be at least one point in here where the slope of the, the tangent line is the same as the slope of that secant line. Okay, and we'll call the x coordinate of that point, we'll actually use that as our x star. Remember, we could have picked our x star to be anything. So let's actually pick the point where the tangent line is exactly the slope of the secant line, the point guaranteed by the mean value theorem. Let's let that be our x star. We'll notice then the slope is just the slope of the tangent line there, but that's f prime, right? This is our capital F, f prime of x star. But notice what is f prime? Isn't f prime just f, lowercase f? So this is equal to delta x times f of x star. So notice the area of this rectangle here is a product of two things. It's length times width, which is delta x times f of x star. 
this vertical amount here, this rise, is a, also a product of two things. It's the run times the slope, but the run is delta x, and the slope is, again, f of x star, little f of x star. So notice this is the same as this. Again, just realize this region is a product of two things. This height is a product of two things, and they're actually the product of the exact same two things. So that tells us the area of the rectangle is the amount that this rises. So the sum of the areas of these rectangles is the total amount that the antiderivative rises. It's the f of b minus f of a. And then you can do the limit of the sum and you end up getting these exact results. So rather than uh, having a flat top, you get curved tops. But the limit of the sum, again, it didn't matter which point you pick inside these subintervals. The limit should be independent of that. So that's ultimately the reasoning behind why the fundamental theorem of calculus is true. This total area is equal to this total length, but this area is the sum of the areas of these individual regions. This length is the sum of the lengths of these individual heights. So if we can show that on any one particular interval, this height is equal to this area, then we're done. And we do it in an approximate way by doing a Riemann sum. So we have flat tops here, but the area of this is a length times width. And the height of this is a run times slope, but the run times the slope ends up being the exact same thing as the length times width. Both of them are delta x times f of x star. So that's why the fundamental theorem of calculus is true. Now, one last thing. I assumed that our function f was positive here. If the function f dipped below the x-axis, then when you do the delta x times f of x star, f of x star will be negative, so you'd end up getting a negative result. So that amount that's below would sort of count as a negative. And here, what would happen is the f would go up and then down and then up again, right? So it would go down when you're dipping below the x-axis here. Now I decided to draw a function here, f, that is sometimes above, sometimes below the x-axis. And if we look at its antiderivative, the antiderivative will rise between a and this point right here. And the amount that the antiderivative rises, this green amount, will be this area. And the antiderivative will drop between these two points. And the amount that it drops, this red amount, is equal to this red area. So you can use the same reasoning that we've been talking about to, to see that. And the amount that it rises again between these points, so this green amount, is this green area. And if you net things out in terms of both the area and in terms of these lengths, you can see that the net signed area will be this f of b minus f of a. But I'll let you work out those details. I think I've given the main idea about why the theorem is true.